I think uh, there's many uh, advantages to taking an historical approach to a particular topic if you happen to be a labor economist. Um, first of all, it, it helps to identify what the, what the classical questions are that people within that field have asked. And often with our graduate students, what we'll say is, look, if you want to dip your toes into history of economics, uh, typically in a dissertation you have a, a chapter where you do a literature review. And often these literature reviews are deadly dull. Uh, they just are, well, reporting on particular uh, papers that may be identified by somebody as, as seminal papers in the area. Well, you can turn something like that into a really nice historical paper by looking at perhaps doing a little bit of archival background, looking at the interactions between the sorts of papers that help define a particular subfield within the field that you're, that you're looking at. So just in, in a very pragmatic way, uh, history of economics can help make you a better labor economist, econometrician, uh, etc. So your question is about my, my scholarship on Hayek, and indeed uh, uh, I started out being interested in Hayek in 1988 when I wrote a paper called uh, Hayek's Transformation that was published in History of Political Economy. And then in the 90s I edited two volumes in a uh, series called The Collected Works of F.A. Hayek, and on the basis of those volumes, the uh, then general editor, Stephen Kresge, invited me to be the uh, editor of the, of the series. So that's a series that uh, was supposed to have 19 volumes in it. 17 have been uh, published, uh, so only two still outstanding. Uh, and we may end up doing a few more volumes of correspondence, but that hasn't really been determined yet. Uh, in the process of, of doing these smaller pieces on Hayek, I decided I wanted to do a book, and I, I wrote a book called Hayek's Challenge. Hayek's Challenge should have carried the subtitle F.A. Hayek and the Limits of Social Science. Uh, I was most interested in his understanding of the methodology of economics and the limits that we face in trying to understand social phenomena. And that... Uh, um, Subtitle was actually changed uh, by the University of Chicago Press to one that they thought would be a bit more uh, uh, user-friendly in terms of attracting uh, uh, sales. But uh, in any event, that was my that was my initial interest in Hayek. It was about his methodological work. Uh, it was always planned, however, that the general editor of the collected works would also uh, do a full biography of Hayek. And in the years since. Uh, finishing Hayek's challenge and taking over the general editorship, I've gotten to know the Hayek family and uh, interviewed uh, Hayek's daughter, Christine, on numerous occasions. We do have his letters from his trip to the United States in 1923 and 24, which are wonderful. He's reacting to being in New York City in the middle of the 1920s. Uh, he had a very strong negative reaction, in fact, to uh, to his environment, uh, as one might imagine, because he came from Vienna, but Vienna was, relative to New York City at the time, was a relatively small place. Even though it had a lot of people, the area that he, that he stayed in uh, was relatively compact, whereas New York City was absolutely exploding uh, at the time that he was there. The subways were being built. Uh, uh, many of the buildings that we now identify with New York City were being constructed. Uh, noise everywhere. Radios had just uh, become invented and, and widely accessible, so he would walk down the street and complain about hearing uh, these strange American tunes, which would be the pop tunes of the day. Yes, we have no bananas. I remember this sound, uh, this this song from my youth, and he just he he actually writes in his letters, you know, this bizarre song. You know, I keep hearing every time I walk down. Instead of opera or something that he thought you know, this, this sort of new device could be used for. The reason I became interested in Hayek originally, uh, as I said earlier, was his methodology. But as I came to study his other contributions, particularly as I'm trying to identify people to become editors of the various volumes in the collected works, and as I was doing my own research for Hayek's challenge, he made contributions within economics um, in terms of monetary economics, theory of the cycle. Uh, he had a very interesting exchange with John Maynard Keynes, but also less well-known, but in the, 
later 30s with people like Oscar Longa, market socialist, with Frank Knight. Uh, he was at the University of Chicago when the Chicago School of Economics was being formed. So he is a person who was at the right place at the right time uh, throughout his career uh, in terms of being at places of intense intellectual activity. And he often had ideas that were, were quite different from those of, of people around him. So he became a fascinating figure for me just because he, he typically did challenge many of the things that, that most of the rest of the people around him uh, thought were, were true or the appropriate way to, to go forward. Uh, so he, in addition to his contributions, uh, early contributions on the monetary uh, theory, uh, he had a battle uh, with the socialists, the socialist calculation debate. He then turned uh, in the uh, war years to uh, writing a, a, a work that he would have titled The Abuse of Reason Project. He never completed it, but The Road to Serfdom was just one small part of that. And it was really an intellectual history. And he went from there to start uh, work uh, after, a, after writing a book on the foundations of theoretical psychology called The Sensory Order. He, he goes into political theory with books like The Constitution of Liberty and Law, Legislation and Liberty. So for me, the, the, the real challenge of trying to understand this guy's thought was I'm trained as an economist and, and I'm an, basically an intellectual historian, a historian of economic thought. So trained as an economist, but have throughout my working career been doing uh, history. Just a fascinating figure, he, controversial, writing in lots of different topics just trying to understand what he's saying, uh, no less why he's, why he's going in particular directions, was itself just a, a very enjoyable journey. So I think I've got a good story. Uh, now it's a matter of putting it all together and also integrating things about his life and, and some of the other things. So it's, a, it's, it's quite a good task. Interestingly, Hayek, when asked about Adam Smith, said that he first came across Adam Smith in translation, he didn't even read him in English, it was just in German as a student, and didn't take it very seriously. And there's an obvious reason why he was being trained by people who had uh, gone through the marginal revolution, and for them, Adam Smith was someone who believed in a labor theory of value or cost of production theory of value, so theoretically, they, they took themselves quite seriously, the marginal, early days of the marginal revolution, they said, well, this is a new approach to economics, so we're, we're going beyond this. And it wasn't until later, actually in that Abuse of Reason project, when Hayek started to investigate the differences between the French Enlightenment and the Scottish Enlightenment. And the way that he characterized it was that he saw Descartes as being a very influential figure in the, in the French Enlightenment and thought that Descartes favored what he called rationalist constructivism, the idea that you can reconstruct society. And of course, Hayek being an opponent of socialism linked some of these ideas of the French Enlightenment with some of the latter uh, developments that, that he was critical of. Whereas he viewed the Scottish Enlightenment, people like Smith, but Hume in particular, Hume was the person that he, he quoted most. Uh, he, he liked Adam Ferguson's uh, idea of uh, uh, human action that, uh, that creates things that are the results of human action but not of human design. He, he loved that that particular phrase, but in terms of the, the, the Scots that he most uh, referenced, uh, it was Hume. And I think it was uh, Hume's idea that reason is not uh, the, the, the source of everything, that, uh, that, that we, have, we have many institutions that emerge in ways that are not uh, due to our reason. And I think that was one of, the, one of the insights that he took away more broadly from the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers, but certainly from Hume. Are there, are there people who are working within economics that he thinks might be on the right path? And the way that I would conceptualize that is that there are a number of movements. And some people sometimes ask me, well, you're, you study Hayek, are you a Hayekian? And I say, no, but, but Hayek was part of a stream of thinkers whose ideas, I think, all cohere very well. And among the current uh, crop of economists, I would people put people like Vernon Smith, uh, James Buchanan, uh, Douglas North. Each one of them, if you look at their writings, uh, reference Hayek as providing an insight that helped them develop their work in various ways. Uh, for Douglas North, uh, the emphasis on institutions and also for Vernon Smith. I mean, 
it's, uh, if we think of the Constitution of Liberty as laying out uh, some ideas about the political institutions, juridical institutions, uh, that if they're in place would allow a market system to work best in terms of creating wealth and supporting individual liberty. Uh, those sorts of ideas are ideas that Hayek was writing about in the 60s and then people like Smith and, and Douglas North who in thinking about how to construct institutions or thinking about the influence of institutions uh, looked to Hayek as someone who was, who was talking about that you know, a generation before. So I think there would be certain lines of, of work that he'd be quite supportive of or, or interested in. Uh, and a, a nice story, uh, people always think about Keynes and Hayek as being great rivals and, and, or even enemies, which is not at all true. Uh, they did uh, debate in the early 30s, but when LSE uh, had to evacuate London uh, during the Blitz, during World, the beginning of World War II, uh, Kane, uh, LSE evacuated to Cambridge, they were at Peterhouse, uh, and uh, Keynes offered Hayek rooms at King's. So they were, they, they went to high table together, they, they were, it, it's hard to say they were close friends because Keynes was spending a most, uh, most of his time in London doing war work or, or over to Bretton Woods or wherever he needed to be, but when they would uh, see each other they would always engage. A new economic thinking is sometimes the discovery of what people have said before. And I think it's uh, undeniable that when you take ideas and then try to model them, you're able to gain certain things through modeling ideas, but you're also losing a lot of the context from which those ideas were originally uh, propounded. Uh, I, I see this over and over again in terms of, of uh, uh, the ideas that are currently viewed as kind of cutting edge. Well, they're cutting edge in the sense that within this model, we hadn't been able to get there, but now we're able to get to that new idea through some in innovation. Yet if you look at the, at the older writers, often they incorporated all of those ideas. And they did it in a messy way. It's not in a, in a formal model, but those ideas were still there. So sometimes the latest innovations are things that, that simply had been forgotten by people who are no longer reading the older writers.